St. Cecilia's, a cathedral for the ages, was made possible with major support from Joe and Ada McDermott, Loveland Lawns, and by the Nebraska Humanities Council, an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, with additional support from the Allen and Marcia Bayer Family Charitable Trust, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and the American Institute of Architects College of Fellows. Its massive twin towers can be seen across the Omaha skyline. St. Cecilia's Cathedral is one of the most impressive buildings in Nebraska. At the time of its construction, nearly a century ago, it was one of the ten largest cathedrals in the country. It is considered to be one of Omaha architect Thomas Kimball's greatest works. But to the people close to it, the cathedral is much more than a building. I can't imagine being without it. This, this is the anchor. Uh, it's a silent anchor around our lives. It's a lifeline for me. It's my bridge to my God. It always reminds me of the work that, and the sacrifices that other people have given to make that happen for uh, generations to come. What makes the cathedral a wonderful structure is not only its architecture, but the fabric of its history, its heritage, and its even the functional use of the space are for very significant things. In the early 1900s, the people of the Northeast Nebraska Diocese built this unique cathedral brick by brick. It took them over 50 years. The cathedral is a lasting tribute to their effort and faith. It's one of those structures that once you see it in Omaha, you won't forget about it. The structure is not one that's built for a short time period like so much of the architecture is today, but it's built for the ages. As it entered its second century, the cathedral was in need of repairs. The Spanish tile roof had leaked and water damaged the ceiling. The people faced the challenge of restoring the cathedral and preserving it for the millennium. This is the story of the struggle to build and renew St. Cecilia's, a cathedral for the ages. St. Cecilia's Cathedral watches over Omaha from one of the highest points in the area. Cathedrals are typically found in the inner city. Named for the third century martyr and patron saint of music, St. Cecilia's is located in a diverse, active, residential neighborhood. The homes range from the modest to the elegant. St. Cecilia's grade school is just across the street. To the Catholic people of Northeast Nebraska, the cathedral is a symbol for the strength of their faith. A cathedral is the home church of the archdiocese and where official ceremonies and regular masses are held. Cathedral comes from the Greek word cathedra, meaning chair, the cathedral houses the chair of the archbishop. After decades of harsh Nebraska weather, the roof was leaking, allowing water to damage the tiles on the ceiling. To assure the future of the cathedral, the huge Spanish tile roof had to be repaired. In the early 1900s, the people of the diocese searched for a way to symbolize the strength of their faith. In the middle of the 19th century, Omaha was a rough-and-tumble frontier town, 
known for its many saloons and muddy streets. St. Mary's Catholic Church became the first church in Omaha and eventually the first cathedral. By the 1860s, St. Philomena's in downtown Omaha became the second. The good economic times of the 1880s led Omaha's population to jump from 30,000 to 100,000. Omaha was now a major city in the West. A great city needed a great cathedral. Soon, a man arrived who would leave his mark on the city. Bishop Richard Scannell saw St. Philomena's getting lost in the city's business district. He knew the growing river town could support a magnificent cathedral. He definitely had a vision that there was a future here, that the Church of Omaha was one which held great promise, and that a cathedral should be built that would be uh, equal to the stature of what he saw the future to be. Scannell soon found a location for Omaha's newest cathedral. Envisioning the city's dramatic growth, he chose an area west of downtown at 40th and Webster Streets, near the site of St. Cecilia's Parish. People opposed it primarily because they didn't see how anybody could get here. The vast majority of people in the city uh, had to rely on walking or public transportation and that sort of thing. The trolley car line only went as far as 24th Street. Bishop Scannell reasoned that the hill at the new location was one of the highest points of the city and would give the cathedral a prominent view of the area. As word of the plan spread, a young Omaha architect named Thomas Kimball expressed interest in the project. In a letter to Bishop Scannell, he wrote, I have set my heart on building this building for you and I want to at least feel that if it should not so work out, I have not myself to blame in the matter. With the Omaha Public Library and the Trans-Mississippi and International Exposition to his credit, Kimball had established himself as one of the Midwest's premier architects. Although not a Catholic, his reputation won out the bishop hired Kimball to design Omaha's great cathedral. Thomas Rogers Kimball was the product of a privileged upbringing. He studied architecture and painting on the East Coast and in Europe. He was a skilled watercolor painter and fluent in French. His education separated him from other architects in the area. However, Kimball's pursuits outside of architecture were not always that refined. His interest in cockfighting landed him in court several times. He once had more than 500 birds at his mother's home on St. Mary's Avenue. But it was his passion for architecture that led him to pursue the cathedral project. He saw this as an opportunity in architecture at a very young age to do the type of structure that I believe he could be known for for the rest of his career. Most American cathedrals of the 19th century imitated the Gothic style of European cathedrals. Kimball chose Spanish Renaissance Revival for the St. Cecilia's design. Spanish Renaissance is more massive and fortress-like. Inside, it is brighter and more optimistic. Gothic architecture is known for its tall, slender arches and dark interiors. Kimball is reported to have said, you know, that probably the first non-indigenous people to come up in this neck of the woods, although we know they never got quite as far as Nebraska, would have been the Spanish. For this reason, Kimball also felt like this could be an appropriate choice. Now, in my heart of hearts, I think he just was fascinated with the style and he wanted to do something different and just not do another knockoff of a Gothic cathedral. Kimball's design called for a simple nave. Side aisles run completely around the church. 
The altar beneath the apse is the central focus point. The bell towers stand over 200 feet above the ground. Massive buttresses support the weight of the Spanish tile roof. The estimated cost of building the cathedral came to $350,000, an astronomical figure for the time. But the desire for a great cathedral won out. Bishop Scannell insisted that construction would not begin without money in the bank. He appealed to the people of the Omaha Diocese for the funds. Around the turn of the century, Omaha's Catholic population was mostly made up of immigrants. They came to America seeking jobs. A strong work ethic was surpassed only by dedication to their faith. There was a great sense among the Catholic people here in Omaha and around the United States that they wanted to be seen as full-fledged Americans, completely uh, loyal to the principles of a nation that was generally thought of as Protestant. The new cathedral would be a symbol that Omaha's Catholics were establishing themselves materially and culturally. After years of planning and controversy, construction began on the cathedral. The local Catholic newspaper barely mentioned the groundbreaking in May of 1905. Two years later, the foundation was complete and great fanfare accompanied the laying of the cornerstone. The ceremony began with a parade that started at 17th and Farnham Street. They marched all the way to 40th Street. When the parade of 10,000 reached the site, another 20,000 people were waiting to witness the ceremony. The event reflected a sense of promise and hope for Omaha's Catholic people. In the next several years, the cathedral progressed until May of 1909, when the money for construction ran out. Bishop Skinnell's no-debt policy forced work on the cathedral to stop. The unfinished shell stood on the hill outside the city, waiting for more money to be raised. When you go through the records and the archives, there were big gifts. But a great deal of this building is here because of the nickels and the dimes and the dollars. So this was not just about people with great wealth. This was really about the vast majority of very average people, you know, doing what they could. Funds came in and the construction resumed. Two events after 1910 forced progress on the construction. Since his arrival in Omaha, Bishop Richard Scannell had been the driving force behind the new cathedral. He died in January of 1916 at the age of 70. Though Scannell did not see his dream completed, church officials used the installation of his successor, Bishop Jeremiah Hardy, as an opportunity to use the unfinished cathedral for the first time. The second event to force progress on the cathedral happened in November of 1917. A fierce windstorm blew down scaffolding used to erect the new cathedral. It landed squarely on St. Cecilia's Church, which had recently been moved next to the construction site. The church was completely destroyed. It was the eve of the Feast of St. Cecilia. Workers hastily prepared the new cathedral for services the following Sunday. From this point forward, the cathedral would be used on a regular basis. By 1930, the cathedral had progressed far enough to be the site for the National Eucharistic Congress. The event called dignitaries and lay people from around the world to gather for prayer and celebration. Omaha's cathedral now had national and international attention.
For almost 30 years, Kimball devoted himself to the cathedral. Like Bishop Scannell, he would not see the building completed. In 1934, Thomas Kimball died at the age of 72. The crown jewel of his career would be completed without his guiding hand. It's, in a sense, a tribute to their dedication to the future, to the generations to come, to the, the people of the city and the state, that they put themselves in the background, not worrying about whether they'd see the finish, so long as the quality and the scale of the project would be admired far, far into the future. Through the 1930s and 40s, the generosity of the cathedral parishioners pushed the project toward completion. I think people give to projects like this partly because uh, it's bigger than themselves and, uh, and something that you assume will be there after you're not around anymore. In the late 40s, the new Archbishop, Gerald Bergen, and Monsignor Ernest Graham made it their mission to complete the cathedral. The newly installed ceiling tiles helped dampen the lively acoustics. Slabs of marble gradually covered the red bricks on the pillars. Workers tore out the original plaster ribs in the apse ceiling and replaced them with an imposing image of Christ. It was disliked by nearly everyone, and a painting of St. Cecilia replaced it in less than 10 years. Whether it was construction work or mass, there was always activity in the cathedral. In those days, we went to mass every day. So you sat underneath the scaffolding and we didn't think anything of it. We used to joke about the fact, you know, you're up and down every two minutes and out for communion and back in and invariably, the scaffolding would move from week to week and you'd forget, you know, and bump your head. So we all used to laugh and say how many bumps and scars we have in the scaffolding, but nobody thought a thing of it. By the end of the 1950s, the cathedral was in its fifth decade of construction. By comparison, many European cathedrals took centuries to build. In 1959, workers completed the bell towers and installed the bells. The ambitious project was now finished and debt-free. Archbishop Bergen consecrated the cathedral in 1959. St. Cecilia's was ready to serve the Archdiocese of Northeast Nebraska. In the following years, the cathedral flourished, becoming the heart of the vibrant neighborhood that grew around it. I can't imagine being without it. This, this is the anchor. Uh, it's a silent anchor around our lives. I really don't view it as a magnificent structure, despite the fact that it is. I, I see it as kind of coming home. It's where I've always been. I love it because of the connection it gives me with my God through his people in an incredibly beautiful place with wonderful music, with traditional liturgies, uh, surrounded by people that I have known forever. This is for everybody. This isn't just for the parish people. This is it for the whole community of Omaha, the archdiocese. So this really is everybody's home. Now approaching its 100th year, the grand design of St. Cecilia's provided a unique challenge to the people who called it home. In 1997, after decades of harsh Nebraska weather, the cathedral showed signs of age. Water leaking from the roof had damaged the ceiling. An engineering study found that although the roof tiles themselves were in good shape, the materials beneath them had rotted. 
the roof would have to be fixed. Then the damaged ceiling could be repaired. It was really just sort of a clean up, fix up approach on the ceiling until more money could be raised to do a real proper historic restoration project. Roofers tore off the old Spanish tiles, then replaced the rotted materials beneath them. Roughly 80% of the old tiles could be reused. The 12-month job on the roof began in August of 1998. In the spring of 1999, as the roof work drew closer to completion, attention turned to the interior of the church. Bids for the roof came in well under projected costs. The extra money meant a whole new vision of the ceiling could be created. We wanted to go back to the original intent because we felt the quality of that architect, of Thomas Kimball, was so high and he was so talented and so admired that why would you want to divert from that or it'd be uh, egotistical to think we could do better than, than what he would have intended. What's going to happen is the first bay is going to take a little bit longer because it's going to be a learning curve sure. and then we'll make it up on the other ones. The restoration team planned to replace the painting of St. Cecilia with the original decorative plaster ribs. Plans included painting over the gray and maroon color scheme applied in the 50s with brighter colors. Project leaders also created mosaic paintings of local and national church history to replace the images of Bible stories. To give workers safe access to heights of 80 to 100 feet, engineers designed a massive rolling scaffolding system that could be moved as work progressed. With the structure in place, the work removing the acoustic tiles began. The most important question that was asked from the very beginning was, what kind of effect will that have on the acoustics of the space? Because those original tiles were put there for a reason. And the reason was is that that space was so live with the hard plaster surfaces and the marble and the stone walls that people had trouble hearing the spoken word. A modern sound system answered the acoustics question. Photographs from the 1950s gave designers general information on the plaster ribs, but not enough detail to build them accurately. We went down into the basement, down into the crypt of the cathedral, and back in a dusty little alcove, we found actual pieces of plaster that were the original pieces of plaster. I don't think that they were from the demolition. I think they were ones that were made originally when the, when the cathedral was built. They were extras that had been stored away there in case they were ever needed as replacements. The reassembly of the, of the ornamental plaster work in the apse is absolutely historically accurate because we found these pieces. There's no interpretation at all. The funds left over from the roof allowed for other improvements. Workers cleaned the marble throughout the cathedral. Artists restored paintings that had faded over the decades. For the final touch, painters added gold leaf to the plaster trim accenting the intricate details of the decorative plaster. One sees the variety of colors and the, the, the light glinting off the, the gold leaf, and you just feel this building has a life to it that is as strong and, and vital as it was when it was new, and probably, we surely hope, will have this kind of vigorous life for a few generations to come. This has really created a very, very open, celebratory kind of a space up on the ceiling. But perhaps on an emotional level, it feels very joyous. The whole place just really feels like it's been expanded.
where the marriage between architecture and music happens is in acoustics. I mean, there's a very direct correlation between the forms of this building and, and what the experience of hearing sound made in this environment uh, is like. And that, that marriage of uh, the grandeur of the setting, the grandeur of the sound, and the artistry of the performer uh, all really kind of combines together to create this uh, experience that's truly unique to this kind of a space. It's a magnificent structure in the time period that was built and the way that it has maintained its integrity uh, and still stands as an, uh, an important structure, an important place, and will now with the renovation for another hundred years. And the structure is not one that's built for a short time period like so much of the architecture is today, but it's built for the ages. St. Cecilia's, a cathedral for the ages, was made possible with major support from Joe and Ada McDermott, Loveland Lawns, and by the Nebraska Humanities Council, an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, with additional support from the Allen and Marcia Bayer Family Charitable Trust, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and the American Institute of Architects College of Fellows.